So thank you everyone for coming to seeing uh, our first session of conversations. Um, hopefully it's the start of a whole new series that will begin during the summer. We'll see how it goes. So I hope everybody's well, everybody's okay. Um, and the idea of having this notion of conversations is really about um, missing each other. Like we really miss each other a lot in the past before all this happened that we've had these kind of amazing talks and sharing information and sharing um, ideas with each other. And we thought, how could there be a way that we can do that? And so as I admitting more people in, Catherine Herbst was born in Champaign, Illinois, but I would consider her a native of San Diego. And some might even say a native to Baja California. She received her master's of architecture from Montana State. Um, and from 1986 to 2000, she worked at various firms, including Rob Quigley. She earned her license in practice in 1995. And in 2000, she formed a practice, Reinhard Herbst, with her husband, Todd Reinhardt. The practice is working on a modest residential and commercial work um, in California, Colorado, and Mexico. Reinhard Herbst was included in MIX, nine San Diego architects and designers, comprised of lead architectural designers in, San, in the San Diego region and beyond. The LA Times referred to the firm's work as smart and hyper-economical, but because of those conditions and the way I think the office produces that hyper-economical work, it, produces, it really produces this amazing, elegant aesthetic. Uh, she was a visiting professor at Montana State in 2006, and chair, she was chair of the San Diego campus. And I would say that, that that aura of her being chair is still present with us today. Marcel Sanchez is, Prieto is the founder of Crow Studio, a collaborative practice at the border region of Tijuana and San Diego that focuses on urban renewal through architecture and research, including design methods that expand geometry as a tool for architectural innovation incorporating civic values and opportunistic conditions. Marcel has taught all over the world, many places, and is currently professor at Woodbury in San Diego. He is a recipient also of many awards, um, and especially ones that are significant in Central and South America. This one, I think a big piece of it is the um, 2014 Di Ibero American Biennale for Architecture and Urbanism that was uh, presented, I think at that time, in Rosario, Argentina. Um, Marcel received his bachelor's from Iberoamerica and a master's of architecture from UCLA. And then finally, he returned to Woodbury in San Diego um, this fall from, uh, from Rome um, as a recipient of the Rome Prize. And with that quick introduction, I'm gonna leave it to Catherine and Marcel. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Sorry. So, well, thank you guys for all um, giving us a little bit of your time and, and the opportunity to share our, our work and, and, and uh, most of all, uh, have a conversation. Like we were saying, uh, it's a good time to kind of get together. And I think that what we wanted to do is a little bit what we already been doing in San Diego uh, with Catherine and Jose and all of us. We, we we call faculty faculty development in our own kind of kind of moments that we start kind of just going around the block or get a beer or something. We just talk about ideas and, and things that we're do, sharing and things we're interested in, in work. So I think that that's uh, something we miss a lot. And I, I really enjoyed our conversations as faculty we have in trying to kind of, yeah, get some ideas across and, and help each other. Catherine? <laughs> uh, I can't decide if I miss people when I'm sitting or staring at them on the screen, but <laughs> I guess I miss seeing you physically. I know, um, I know. <laughs> so that part's the hard part. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jose, for putting this together. Um, uh, thanks to everybody who's signed on right now. I see you as black squares with names on them. Marcel and I, uh, I think part of uh, the way we got started, it's, it's hard for me to do these kinds of things. Um, and so Marcel was a bit of a provocateur and had aligned 
maybe this conversation about misalignments, uh, kind of a way he sees our practice. So in the last couple of days, Todd and I have thrown together a series of images about kind of two projects that we've completed and then uh, the project that we're currently working on. And I don't know, do you want me to screen scare right now and just go into it? Yeah, it's here, this is it. Okay, hang on a second, I gotta make sure it's here. Okay, I'm going to screen share. Um, the first series of images will be about two projects that we did. Um, and one's here in San Diego and one's in Mexico. They're both residential projects. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Um, this is a sketchbook. Um, and that doodle at the bottom of it is everything that we own piled up. Um, little things all over our house. And it was kind of a way of thinking about how much space you take up. Um, we were asked to do a house in Mexico. So this is a, a, a residence in a gated community in Baja that's owned by two Americans that are retiring down there. It's a very small lot, 11 meters by 19 meters, and it's sitting on the Pacific Ocean looking over the, looking out west. Um, that's the tiny lot. Um, most of these lots are just built to the edges and the only openings are on the east and the west. And that makes for a pretty nasty little way to live. So we drilled some courtyards into it. Um, and we talked about where you get air and where you get ventilation and how to divide the thing up in a structural system and all the billions of things that you think about when you're an architect. Um, but I think the operative thing for us became a way of thinking about it in terms of a system, a, a series of sections that took on functions. And this is the study model that we made. These are just elevations. These are views, um, vignettes of what we thought we were gonna do. Um, aspirational, I think, in some ways, but clearly um, aligned with the organization that the house ended up having. Um, this is the West Elevation. Um, very, uh, you know, just compositionally made up of rooms. Um, so you can clearly see those apertures or um, into different um, settings. Um, and this is, these are a series of sections as you go from the west to the east or from the beach to the to the driveway essentially. Um, dr drilling a courtyard into it, um, organizing rooms, bringing in light from above and light from the edges. Here's the plans. This is down in the ground. So the right hand side of this drawing is buried in the dirt and so getting light ventilation into the backs of these kinds of spaces is really tricky. Um, I think we were successful. Um, when you go there, the air is good and doesn't smell musty or anything. Um, but again, you know, series of rooms, um, a slight rotation to the center of this, um, to the center courtyard to allow the spaces to expand um, and to create some funny um, alignments with some edges and corners. So these are the images, the rendering images um, that we made, construction photos. Um, these are the done images, courtyard, upstairs, you're standing in the kitchen, standing in the living room or dining room. Um, and this is um, an image, but also I think it's super important to talk about the kind of the way we work. Um, we work together on everything practically. Um, and we have a sketchbook that sits in our kitchen, our living room or dining room that we work on all the time and then we each have our own sketchbooks as we go along um, but this is a sort of thinking about the deep beam scheme um, and the way it helped courtyards more of the same kinds of doodles figuring out a kind of logic for how we're rotating things how we're taking down loads um, anyway this is um, the house that we just finished in Del Mar um, it was uh, but a 900 square foot house and we did it under um, what's called by right development, coastal development. So we were able to go from the day that the clients hired us to them moving in, it took about two years. Um, they actually came to the final reviews at Woodbury 
three years ago. That's how that was our first meeting with us. Um, and this is again, so you're starting to see the study models. This is the deep beams. So sort of rehashing this idea. I think one of the things that's happened to us as we've progressed is we just like, we have a really good idea. We figure out it just stays with you and you just figure out some way to execute it on the next one. And, you know, sooner or later, I think some of these things land. So that's the, the, where we were. It was just again a simple idea about how do you keep the existing things? Where do you add? Um, and then sort of the, the idea that the second floor rotated on top of the first floor, um, this sort of misalignment of floors, which I think is, you know, fairly common, especially in software to extrude as you move up. Um, the rotation of things really started to present opportunities that we didn't, wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, so we get these funny little uh, sort of wedges that start to show up and become thresholds for um, indoor outdoor spaces, create rooms or extra room in areas where you need it, um, model shots, um, elevations. Um, it's not the greatest, we're not the greatest at this. And Todd and I are better at writing haikus than we are at writing. Um, but this kind of way of starting to use language to frame what, you're, what your project's interested in or what you're interested in um, as you progress. Um, again, just renders, um, you know, built on you know, a really good collection of materials and furniture and stuff as you sort of progress along there. Um, rendering, rendering, and then this is what it ended up looking like. Um, they moved in, um, I think right of, or the beginning of last year, um, but they haven't really moved in that much because <laughs> they kind of like it empty. So this is sort of what it looks like. Um, really homogeneous. I think another one of our goals recently is to try to really um, try to be as monochromatic with the work as we can. So just really tone down the kind of um, the background so that the way people live foregrounds. Um, staircase. Um, goof. There's, you know, things like, I, I don't know if for people who are familiar with Woodbury, you notice the door. Um, we did the doors at school that had those panels above them. In this case, we've actually made them operable. So it's a way of keeping it ventilated while keeping it shut. Um, again, these kind of the rotation that happens with these wedges, um, and the kinds of spaces that you get. Um, again, working the deep beam, I think here is much more successful. So that datum line right there is at um, seven foot. Um, and it really has a way of sort of compressing, compressing and expanding spaces. It has a way of defining spaces without complete enclosure. I, th I feel like it was really successful. Um, the stucco in this case, I think I can do this. Is that a, you seen a video? Did the video work? Starting to slowly. It's working. Okay, we worked with some gut. We worked with um, what's called comb stucco. Apparently, it was a technique. Um, you know, everybody wants to build a concrete house, but nobody has the money to do that. Um, and I think the concrete house gets a kind of the, gets too weighty at the bottom. So we were trying to figure out a way to soften the bottom of this house, um, and we came across the rake stucco. We actually had to work with these guys a couple times to get this right, but uh, you know I feel like we were pretty successful. Um, we almost lost the owners at this point, uh, but we made it. Catherine, we, it. Got a, we got a quick question. Um, what the panels were, the, the siding for the wood? The wood siding is uh, Western Red Cedar, uh, one by six um, tongue and groove. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. This, I don't know how, I don't, I don't have anywhere near uh, those, that level of work, but I'll try my best. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm going to start sharing uh, uh, PowerPoint. Share. And then I'm going to go full screen. 
All right, so um, I'm gonna show um, a little bit of a, I'm not gonna show any anything that is built. I'm gonna not talk about a little bit more about um, the ideas and in, in, uh, in, in what has uh, in a way been a concept persistent that has been kind of interesting for us to kind of work with it. And, uh, and also how, um, how has research influence uh, in the American Academy if, uh, been part of it. Anyways, um, of course, um, we, we, we live here in the border and uh, we live in the border and, and the idea of the border, the idea of the, of the fence has been uh, a constant reminder of uh, inequality, differences, and, and the, the just the position of two countries, right? And for instance, what you see here is the backyard, the backyard of my house, and literally uh, the photos that you see here that you're seeing, that's, that's the backyard, if you can see me, that's where we are right now. And the wall that you see in the back is the fence, it's international border, so as you go there, um, just jump, right? And you are in the U.S. So uh, something that uh, that that we we constantly have a reminder of the of this this situation. Of course, the rapid growth of the city, the the incremental kind of density that was done all the way to uh, 2008, right after the collapse, and then of course the regular settlements and and how the poverty of the city has been handled. Uh, of course, also the 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 dreams of crossing the border, the dreams of creating the house, the dreams of, of how to kind of create a property has been a, a big challenge, a big condition of how we, we see when we have a client and design. For instance, here in the middle, that's a, 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 a pamphlet that was used by Urbi, one of the main developers in Tijuana, to, to sell that, yeah, you wanna live like in the US, right? You will have kind of this castle and still, right? But almost like the reality is, is totally different from the photograph from, from uh, Libya Corona. You can see that the sea of, of house. Anyways, this this has been in, uh, important influence. Uh, I would say there is social factors, the conditions of, of the city, they really influence. So I'm gonna show three projects. I'm gonna show a project that, that is in San Diego and a project that is in Mexico. And then in between those two projects, I'm gonna show uh, the research that I recently did in Rome. And in that sense, to, to explain the first project, this, this house is in, uh, in, uh, in Golden Hill in San Diego. And this project, what, we, we, what was interesting is that we work uh, with Tyler Hanson, Philip Bossart, and, um, and uh, Georgina Vest. And what it was interesting how, for instance, uh, Tyler w found this lot and, and it was a great opportunity where a lot that usually has a one house, it was able to be divided uh, into four houses. And so there was a greater opportunity how uh, collaborating uh, with all of us as, as a way to kind of make uh, a stronger kind of cohesion and opportunity to create housing. In that sense, that lot that you can see on the, on the right side is uh, how the house was uh, bought and how the lot was uh, originally kind of bought. And then suddenly as we, as we start dividing the, the lot to create uh, four houses, you can start seeing once again these notions of division, these notions that borders or elements of division or how to kind of start constructing divisions of space it starts to come up. And of course, the first thing is divided in four. And then after that, the divisions of coat or setbacks starts dividing even further that side. And, and that for us, for me, at least for me, it started to become more predominant how these divisions start to kind of construct that. And even in the, in the proposals we started kind of developing everyone, suddenly we started to kind of be careful what, who can see the other neighbor or who is going to see the other. Right? So it starts becoming how the division of these spaces start becoming even more accentuated. And in that case, uh, we were also saying, well, uh, it's part of the, the game. It's part of the, how we... In, in, in cities, it's always about the multitude of, div of linear or divisions or borders that we're totally uh, in constant negotiation. We are always negotiating these borders. So in this project for us, it was a little bit like, how do we start negotiating that? In, in the, in, in for economic reasons and strategic reasons, 
we, we decided to kind of step back, set back as much as we can. Like for instance, this is Tyler, this is Georgina, this is Philip. And we started to kind of see how we step back further back. And we started seeing an opportunity that suddenly that we are going to kind of create, create instead of becoming the, the building is more protruded, the building is more in the back, how to accentuate the space that is in front of us. And in that sense, uh, accentuating the, the, the space that is in front of us, also mm -hmm. how the perimeter, the edge of the, of, the, of the building could be an opportunity to activate and kind of create a platform for negotiation. And you're start, you, can you start, you still hear me see the images uh, flowing or is it stuck yes. somewhere? No, okay. So in, in, this, in this sense, this is something that I, 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 I like I always do, and, 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 and Catherine knows this, that I always consult her, and that's what I really love of, of being in, in, in school, that I always come back and say, hey, Catherine, what do you think about this? And what about that stuff? And then even her project that she showed, that the idea of the datum here is like, okay, yes, I want to create a datum, and we're talking about even how to kind of accentuate that datum in that building, and the perimeter becomes a way that people can hang things or kind of, create a, like a hammock or seating or elements, we saw the edge as an opportunity to something that is influenced by what we see in Mexico. Anyways, the, the notion of this uh, threshold that is the, the, between the two buildings, that becomes an opportunity, but also we have to kind of comply how to create more density in these buildings economically. And so instead of being one single building, it is divided into four units. So this, uh, what it seems like a one house is a one bedroom idea in, in the first level with a, with a one bedroom kind of studio in the first level and another one bedroom on the top and another one bedroom um, on the second floor. And in that sense, now the lot, which was one single house, it has been converted or is going to be converted to more or less 16 units. So it's really densifying that lot into 16 units. In that sense, um, what, we, what we try to kind of then work is saying how, for instance, this facade, what is the, the one, the facade that goes more to the back, it created kind of a framework, uh, say almost like a, a staging, or a, we're thinking more like a open amphitheater kind of playground, that this facade becomes an invited element to everybody to kind of collaborate. And I know this is kind of sometimes um, um, very positive and, and, and maybe nothing happens, but I think that what we try to do is that we create platforms and see the architecture becomes almost like a, a thermometer, a temperature wise of how people are going to kind of be uh, able to uh, be more collective or not collective. And then in that sense, we were saying, well, this could be an opportunity of this trying to be uh, more integrated in that sense. So in then sense, so this facade became more a, a, a way to kind of say, yes, a facade of the building, but it's a facade for the overall kind of collective of all the buildings. So now I'm going to go back to uh, research and, and uh, the, the stuff we do as a, as a middle uh, condition of, of, uh, of, of linking these two projects. This is a project that uh, uh, we developed in, uh, in Rome, uh, the American Academy, and the whole point was to study these stairs, the Fernando San Felice stairs in Naples. So as you see here, this is a series of photographs that takes you through the street that lend, ends up to Fernando San Felice's Palazzo. And this, this Fernando San Felice Palazzo it was a, a palazzo that in many ways revolutionized the condition of the city. So this palazzo is, is one single palazzo, but the palazzo is divided in two entrances. In, in one entrance is Sanita uh, two, and then Sanita number six. And what is interesting, the compression, the density of the city started to kind of kind of unfold to the inside and in how the stairs become uh, another layer of facade. And I will explain why it was the reason in a few moments. So here you see Sanita 2, and I'm going to show you now a video. Hopefully you can see this thing. So this is the, the, like I said, the left side, that's Sanitatu. And this is, this is uh, the beginning of what was already a, a existing falazo and then transformed that, infusing the other one.
Now this is the other stair, the Sanita 6. This is uh, that type of stairs called uh, Ala de Falco, Hawkwing uh, stairs. Now we see the, the video of that one. So this is the, the, the moment where these two palazzos uh, they're, they're, were trying to fuse together. So as you see the two different scales in the, in the top floor, where, that's where uh, Fernando San Felice, who designed these stairs, was living. Anyways, okay, so why stairs and what is the relevance of these stairs? Well, we need to go back a little bit to, to the Agavine in the beginning where the Spanish, uh, Right, ruling the viceroy from from Spain, uh, Francisco de Toledo, was the Kingdom of Naples. And in this um, uh, map by by Duperec, you can see that uh, the the wall, the perimeter wall of Naples containing the city, is very evident. And that wall, yes, uh, for many reasons that we know why in medieval times they were starting to generate, but in this time it was emphasized even further for two main reasons. One, because the Viceroy at that moment wanted to contain the city, to not grow, to keep it to, to that limit of, of density for better taxation of the population, but also to keep people working in agriculture to sustain the city. So those two main reasons were the driver to maintain the city at that level. In the next uh, 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 map, right, that we see how, for instance, now the city, what was the edge of it, we start trickling down to the outside the walls, what it could be now understood Sanita and Mater Dei. But uh, also this map shows how the Viceroy was emphasizing the shift of power in creating Via de Toledo, the first uh, road, and even shifting the perspective of the map to become centralized to the new uh, Spanish quarter. So what we see here is the Spanish quarter. But in that sense, when the city was not able to contain itself, uh, then we see uh, Duca de Noja's map. And suddenly, the, the growth of the city cannot be sustained. So Duca de Noja, and now in the 1775, proposes to create this map, very similar to Noli, very, in many regards, almost uh, identical, uh, in cre even uses people from Noli to create this map. Of course, this map was a plea to the severe story to, to create a map that helps uh, to better organize the city, to better structure the city. So what did they do? Very similar to Noli map, creating this continuation of the public space and almost like how the court just become a continuation. Uh, a little bit different when in Noli but was the church, right? But here, for instance, these are the two stairs that we see, the one that we saw the film, the one Sanita 2 and Sanita 6. This is the Palazzo Fernando, Fernando San Felice. And what I was doing there is trying to kind of register as many prototypes that came from that one. And I was able to register almost 220 uh, stairs, measure them, and many of them I was able to film with a drone and kind of capture and create a catalog of those stairs. So what happened in this sense that the, those stairs, uh, what, what it was going on is that growth in the city was illegal. So the stairs were a way to kind of growth illegally, create bigger density. So started, the palazzo started to transform in that sense. And the walls started to demolish because then they made the argument that the city needed to grow. And then Fernando San Felice uh, was able to convince, in many ways, the Viceroy to start dismantling these walls and saying that the city needed to grow. So here uh, you see uh, in uh, 100 years later, in 1885, 86, if I remember well, then you have Federico Schiavoni who creates this map. 
And this map was very important for me to kind of capture and understand that the impact of the stair had at the bigger scale of the city. So here, for instance, now you see the same project of Fernando San Felice, and in that, that scale, he draws every little stair in each palazzo. So this is, a, from my point of view, is the continuation of the Noli map. Now you will see, for instance, how this comparison between uh, Duca di Noja and Federico Schiavoni, how the fusion and transformation of the Palazzo, and then drawing this void space and transforming the stairs. Here you see the other one. This is Fernando San Felice. And this is the two stairs. The one on the right is Ala de Falco, and the other one is a scroll. And these stairs start to become more popular and more popular throughout the city. And I will say that these elements become the character of what the city is, of how the continuation of public space to the inside. So at the end, these two um, quotes, I think that in some way synthesize the idea of how architecture, the geometries and the dexterity of geometry that were being constructed by the stairs, but also how, for instance, Cesare Zeta talks about the idea of thresholds and limits and how the negotiation of these limits are being contested and to create an urbanity. So these stairs, although they were, they were very elegantly in, in, in many ways kind of constructed. They were the opportunity to demolish and kind of keep the growth of the city and then become, in any case, an illegal act of urbanism. So the, all these stairs, then from my point of view, the element of the architecture, the element of the stair, a simple stair, really understands the complexity of the whole city, understands the livelihood and understanding of the whole city. So these variations that from the portico to the corja to the stair, you can go through Naples and see this quality, this uh, characteristic repeated throughout the city. Anyway, so well, at the end, what we, what we always ask ourselves and saying, what are the questions that we raise? And I think that that question, in, for instance, in that research is saying how uh, uh, an architectural element as simple as a stair or an element that is sometimes uh, forgotten or tucked away, how can it produce something to become more civic or how to create something that becomes more uh, an opportunity? For instance, in those stairs, the stairs became an opportunity to just to kind of densify, just to kind of create another levels of the first, the beginning of fracturing the palazzo into creating different uh, 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 places for rent and sublet, but also how to produce a more civic condition. So what um, uh, but Mr. Fuller asked is saying how much your building weighs for us is sometimes how civic or how productive a building can be. Anyways, I'm going to show um, uh, not the both of them, but we work on two projects for Infonavit, and I'm going to show a, a project in Infonavit that I think relates to the idea of this theory and how, what is important. So in this project that we work for Infonavit in, in the, in the, the these developments that I was talking about at the beginning, like Urbin Geo, that they wanted to produce the higher density in these areas, but they were very horizontal. So they came back and kind of asked us to do a prototype for a higher density in one typical lot, very small lot, six meters by 17 meters uh, depth. And then we needed to kind of produce at least four units in, in, in that area. So what we first did is a very simple thing. You're not, you have to imagine this is no budget. This has to be very, very simple. And usually what happens is that you have the uh, kitchen and living room and the two rooms are stuck in the, the other side. And the basic thing, very simple move that we did is just say, well, why don't we just put the two rooms on the end? So the two uh, bedrooms, we put it on the end. And then here's where it becomes the strategy of the stairs. So this stairs is located in this space so that this, uh, front unit be becomes something else because 50 or 60 percent of the population of, of these areas they need to do another sort of income there's there's no way that you can just live with a formal uh, economy they have they have to create another informal economy so in this case what we're, we're thinking is that, that these levels that are in different tiers they can become something else so for instance, here, what we did is that the beginning of the first floor can become, yes, a tire shop, a, a commercial kind of 
pop and pop uh, the area of uh, a little market or a little bit of a more uh, of a production. And then the second level is we can think that that first unit become a way to kind of say uh, a tailor shop or a mini restaurant or even a production set. So that front part with the stairs located there, that can be transformed and can be changed. So we thought that, that this idea of just the house being a house, not it need to be transformed into just leave work and then being more productive. So this idea of floor area ratio, then it's transformed to transformation area ratio and productive area ratios. So that's the end of uh, my presentation. And I just wanted to show how, for instance, uh, these ideas of economies and these ideas of, of, of constraints and how these things of, of, of elements of architecture can maybe produce a bigger kind of impact that if proliferated can be bigger impact in the society and how small architecture can have that 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 uh, magnitude of changing or transforming society. So Catherine <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a second slide show you should I do that one? Oh, yeah. For the for the project we're working on right now. Go for it, yeah. Uh, I, mostly because I think this is where our, yours and my conversations have centered is kind of on our, the work we're doing for, for ourselves, I guess, um, and how that resonates with what we do at school and kind of maybe the spheres of influence that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna do this super fast because you know it's, um, it's our project, so here in the barrio, and it's um, we've been working on it for a really long time. Uh, we've looked at a billion options. Um, tell me if you're getting this show. Do you yep. see an image? Yep. Okay. So th I'm gonna. This is kind of where we're at. I'm gonna try to sort of construct a history for it a little bit as we go through, um, and I'm gonna go as fast as I can. So I'll be like uh, Kyung Park. Um, it's, um, when you do a project for yourself, you start with a kind of envelope or a constraint. Uh, the constraint, and what we started was just the zoning envelope and really trying to maybe, I would say a little bit of the subverting the rules. Um, we're zoned commercial um, and everybody um, builds residential um, and plays games with mezzanines and does all sorts of things that either end up having to tell different stories to different people. It just became, became really complicated. So I, I call the scheme sort of one, two, and three. They were sort of, they were governed by an idea of how they're organized and how they're roofed. Um, and then the, spiritually throughout the thing, you'll see uh, images from our sketchbook along the way. Um, that's the group sketchbook in the morning. Um, and you'll see images, oh, I'll, I'll just come clean. We're on scheme 19.5, I think. Um, so when it has a point to it, it means that it's gone further along than just sort of a schematic level. Um, we built, we've built working drawings, I would say, for probably 19 schemes. So that's why there's a ton of detail in some of these things, you know, figuring out block modules and stud bays and all this kind of stuff that you do when you're, really making a building. Um, so, so that'll be interspersed in here too. So this is the, the three roof scheme, which is I think really where we sort of started. Um, and these are some images from how we work some of those things out. Um, open and close, uh, rhythms and proportions, pattern, um, I don't know, just goofing, uh, goofing, goofing. Um, different configurations of openings, different relationships of openings, how um, volumes affect ground planes, how openings affect surfaces, how you play with solids and voids um, in elevation and in plan. Every once in a while you come up with a really great unit, which is that unit that's sort of highlighted over there. Um, I really, really loved that unit for a while. It's gone, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Different uh, roof studies, different, I, I don't know what I call them, profile studies. It's like the like an elevational noli, I guess, maybe. Um, doodles, doodles, doodles. Um, 
uh, developing a kind of icon or a, a kind of a simple way of sort of attacking the ground or attacking the building form, dividing the building form, organizing building form. Um, the image on the left is actually a little window that we made on the back of our office. And so we were really interested in these moments where you could art be super articulate with a, with a little tiny element that really gave it a kind of personality or individuality. Um, so I'm getting a, a chat. Is somebody not getting images? Okay. Um, We're getting compliments. Oh, <laughs> I don't get those, so that's good. Keep those there. Um, doodles, you can see doodling on the Netflix envelope sometimes when, believe it or not, you're at, you don't have paper or you don't, you're too lazy to go get something, so um, that becomes a thing. Uh, interior perspectives or kind of vignette views of things. Um, and I think this is where Marcel and I, uh, I think where he sees a lot of our work is this, this idea of the rotation or the misalignment of things. Um, I think Todd and I have worked in the industry long enough and done a ton of, a ton of housing where we realized that the sort of alignments are based on a, a history um, of um, things stacking of trades working um, simultaneously with each other and having somebody who coordinates all of that. Um, I think we're in a world where it's better if people can come in clean, do their job and get out, uh, the compartmentalizing of labor. Um, so again, you know, just really looking at the quality of some of these rooms, how the things are divided up on the property, um, rotation. Uh, we spent a lot of time figuring out how to, um, I would, for lack of a better word, subvert the rule of being a commercial zone and figuring out ways to make units that would read as commercial and then be converted to residential by us doing some work afterwards. Um, and that's a series of you know, studies there. Um, I think, again, that's a really great unit that the way that the uh, sort of infrastructure of the unit is aligned on the one side and you get a big indoor space and a big outdoor space. Um, study models that are sort of done in the same way. Um, more refined models. This is um, Isabella Santini who graduated from Woodbury, building a little model in her office. We made a gift out of it. This was a one roof, the three roof scheme to the one roof scheme. Again, sort of Solid void patterns, textures, um, deep beams, rooms, uh, roofs. Um, this is actually, this is a moment of desperation where we took a previous project and threw it on the um, property and stretched it to the new extremes. So it was a way of seeing our work through our work. Um, more of this one roof scheme big one roof thing, maybe starting to real, uh, fit in with the industrial character of sort of Barrio Logan, how these one roof schemes then organize the plan, how the units were organized around that, how the sort of leftover infrastructure of the previous scheme was now rotated and put into different configurations, one roof scheme, one roof scheme, different courtyards, still part of the one roof scheme. Um, then we got to two roofs. I don't, um, so kind of a big base and two sort of buildings on top of it. Um, Todd and I've been in the borough for about 10 or 11 years. It's really noisy down here. It's really dirty down here. Um, and if anybody's ever been to our studio, we sort of have a, I call it the fort. So there's kind of white, it's a concrete block bunker with a, with white glass. We actually don't really see a lot of stuff going on outside, um, but we can sense the movement of the sun and be connected to it tangentially. Um, again, sort of massing studies, uh, solid void relationships, uh, uh, outdoor spaces, screens, um, uh, figuring out where the operable components of these roofs were. Uh, we had this amazing palm tree out front and it died actually recently. Um, this is uh, uh, a friend of ours has two, uh, has four 50 foot long um, bow trusses and he was wondering if we could use those so we played with this for a while um i think it's super important for us as practitioners and educators to connect to i would say the to vernacular architecture and to the discipline of architects so other people that work in the discipline of architecture 
Um, and, and I think, you know, and working together with each other is really important. So this is, again, a sort of vault scheme on the other uh, billion options, billion ways to study it. Um, this project started out as nine of us working together. Um, I think some people know the, the history of this or the mythology of this, but um, nine people, architects got together and we're gonna go, we're gonna actually build Woodbury University on nine separate properties. Um, that devolved over the last 15 years or whatever. Um, but this is some of the early work. So this is uh, when we had this lot, had a little building on it. These are some of the schemes. So you can sort of see our lot was, I don't know if I can point to it, um, is the L-shaped building on the corner there. So um, everybody had a component of the program they were taking on. And when we had this big sort of parking structure that came up parallel to the freeway that made a kind of new ground, but also sort of buffered a lot of that noise and debris that happens from the freeway. Um, these are these guys again. Um, that's our scheme just to the, our lot just to the south of the, or just to the right of the red buildings in the foreground. Um, that's our lot with the light bulb box on it. Um, and then this is where we are right now. Um, so this is pretty far developed. Um, this is, we're calling it a two roof scheme. Um, we, so in the conversation that Marcel and I have been having, uh, when he, when he suggested the word misalignment, um, Tom and I have been really struggling with the space in between those two buildings. So the most recent resolution of this project is actually on the space in between. Um, and I'll just show you a series of images, but again, sort of informed by how do you get viable outdoor space? Um, that's the space in between. So we, we built a wall that runs perpendicular to the base of the building, but is counter rotated to the rotation of the units up above and I think gives us some real opportunities up there. Um, these are just vignettes straight out of the software. Um, you, know, you can see the sort of level of decision making that's happening. Um, uh, the sewer lines, the vent lines, the stud base spacing, the joists layout, the hardware, the courtyards, the block modules, the you name it. Um, this is, again, another way of studying. This is a different scheme. This is like a doodle that sits right next to, um, it's like a little three by three pad of paper that you kind of exercise some things on it. But it was this idea of maybe rotating some of the metal siding and where the opportunities for that rotation would exist. Starts out as a kind of dumb doodle, but then it actually gets to the project. These are um, just fun images coming out of the software. Um, and then, you know, the, it's super important for me to look at other people's work. Um, and we're really inspired by Caruso St. John. Um, I think those guys just never get off the mat. Um, and they do a lot of really good work. Um, and so this is just one of the projects that we grabbed to sort of give them kudos. Um, this is a series of color studies of different color metal. Um, I don't know. That was it. Was that fast? It was. <laughs> so what do you think, Catherine? I, I think that uh, I, 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 really, I really like how, for instance, you're, you're always like, for instance, even in, in, the, in the way your presentation is more like a series of either either if, right? A lot of kind of fast pace, even what like you were saying, everything's like, I don't know if, if it is more like a, a way of, doing right by crafting and crafting and even reminds me even when we're in meetings every time you are in meetings you're sketching right even whatever's happening in, in in some way we have other things going on and you're always always sketching so the the process of you is is always in constant kind of refinement and sketching and sketching and and it is right like we're saying it's very artistic in in many ways and i think that's what i i really I really enjoy in your work is that it's, it's more like do it and then how these things start to kind of uh, uh, I think it's something that you and I talk about a lot is a kind of how do you have your own feedback loop um, how do you inform yourself I think the metric for success um, and something has got to be internal it's not 
we're not all going to get pats on the back or awards for things that we do. So it has to really be the kind of, you know, what are you really interested in doing? Why do you, what, what motivates you to keep working? Um, for me, the, I'm, I'm not a great writer. Um, it's not words and discussions that really propel the work for me. It's a feedback loop that happens between sort of the discussions that I have with Todd and with other colleagues. Eric worked here for a long time. I mean, we really have a kind of, we get a good dialogue going on stuff. And that dialogue happens around drawings and drawings are a way of propelling work forward and drawings are a generative method. No, and I agree that I think that that's, uh, in my opinion, I definitely am not a force. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm a sketcher and I didn't send. Uh, yeah, I yeah, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I don't show the whole, the, the whole things. I think for me, it's, it's definitely that the sketch is, is uh, drawing is a, is a mode of thinking. Definitely it's a process of distilling ideas and, and, and doing that. Um, I found even, for instance, right now, like if you see in my drawings, and, and I do a lot of axonometric section perspectives and, and, and accentuating these things, and, and sometimes it's more refined. But I think that uh, in my what I what I I think is in the end uh, what I, my in my work when I start kind of defining these kind of uh, more kind of ways of strategizing the the drawing that the drawing becomes uh, a concept driver, uh, more of a a strategic or, or more like a strategic of social conditions and I think that that's what I've always tried to say that the interest is one and in my opinion I think it's one but also how how we start kind of uh, also um, at least for me in, in this in this context of Tijuana I always try to say what are the the, the, the strategies or the implementation of these strategies that have not beyond just uh, the, the architecture itself or how to kind of think about it, not just only within the architecture. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think that that's something that I always try to kind of see that that is not uh, something that is, is in our own discipline and sometimes, right? Or how do we talk about it? How do we just talk about it in our own discipline? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I think so. I think, um... It's, I mean, I think it's a, you know, let's just say it's a running conversation for us about, you know, sort of how do you spatialize a lot of the things that we think about. Uh, I think it's um, the context that, the context I think for both of us is broadly defined and in a lot of ways idiosyncratically defined. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and but I, th I think that, that there's something. That, I think that's what where, what is interesting. That for instance, uh, the the stuff you're talking about proportions, sketching, kind of having composition. I think that something that we have lost in many ways is to talk about composition or the idea of, of composition. We we kind of lost that uh, notion, right? And I understand that. That's what I always try to kind of also in, in my studios, right? Saying what is composition? What are you talking about composition? What is what, how can we evaluate composition? that's important and I think that's something that you see a lot in your work also one, one of the things that that, that I also kind of uh, like about uh, or kind of we, we talked about misalignments when I was saying misalignments and this, I think that that there's a need why 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 is that need in, in the saying of of not having a, a that wall or why the misalignment starts to occur and what is that misalignment creating in space and then I think that in your projects are are always a little bit like trying to define uh, the space but also try to kind of to kind of give us another perception and that the, the, the misalignments creates this kind of tension of between how these spaces are being constructed and but I why do you think these align, misalignments are, are, are something you're did, I think in the last five years or six years right yeah, I, you know, I don't, you were the one that added misalignment to it. I think Todd and I are just like, might even be dumber than that. It's like, if you open up the corner, it makes the room different. If you uh, create a, if you get outside of um, parallelograms, um, you can create, you change the way somebody perceives space. I think it goes back to just kind of perception, uh, you know, that architecture deals with space and lines and geometries and that you can, you can prolong things, you can elongate things, you can compress things. And that these are compositional ideas or space that, that have spatial manifestation. I think it's something that every architect works with. It, 
just um, the reality or the the definition of it is easier for for us to work with because of the way that we work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I think that that's that's what I see. And and my point of view that that when you construct this this series of, of iterations or, or spaces is when, when we start seeing how material, right, how materials are coming together. And I think that in your work uh, is, 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 is something that uh, I see that materials is always a, a very important factor. And, and, I, I'm, and maybe for me, because of the context, yes, material is something that we, of course, we need to think about. Like even the, the hospital is under construction right now, we have to take into account the material. But sometimes like the library, right, like the library, Material is not is not the first thing we think about. Mm -hmm. Honestly, material is not the thing that we 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 we, we consider the element. And sometimes material becomes the the background, and, and maybe in this context we 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 think about how the material is, is more about uh, staging and framing than, than the material itself or how you perceive the material itself. Yeah. Anyways, I think that uh, we're running uh, already two o'clock. I don't know what is the time frame that we have. Two or three, yeah. Any questions? Should we ask questions? Have people ask questions? That's a great idea. Does anybody have questions before we leave? Well, for I had a question. Whether do you sh uh, share all your iterative sketches with your clients? Just out of curiosity. No, this is this is a um... your private language. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, truthfully, the digital model is too. We, uh, the level that we go through with the digital model is, is I would call them the tools for us to make architecture. Um, it's not, uh, I, I don't feel like my role is to educate my client. It, my role is to, um, to sort of, um, meet their basic needs but to push beyond that um and align ideas and uh align with the discipline of architecture and the richness that that, that it holds so yeah no we don't we we actually we never give clients drawings till we're through design development um, they can take pictures of our models they can take pictures of our sketches but it's not their stuff it's our stuff there's a question there saying, what is, what's the project line, what's the top project timeline for completion on your own person, personal projects you presented? What is, what I understand the uh, question is, what is the time frame of the, of the projects? Um, so the, the one we're working on for ourselves is not fair, right? We got the property in 2004, we started drawing at that point. I mean, it's 2020, I mean, I don't, it's not a good, it's not a it's not a it's not a model it's just the way that you know we have the luxury of working because we own the property and we don't need to do something right now and it takes a long time to do architecture so i i would say it's the total opposite from my end uh yeah i don't have time at all so time projects are very limited i have to make quick decisions i have to kind of respond to the economic conditions that i'm i'm against it i would say that almost all my projects are in very time frames for instance the library i had to design it and make construction documents in one month the module that i did for the for the social health services is module this 32 modules they were there they were distributed to Baja california we had six thousand dollars and had to be designed in one week the project for infonavit right this is always time limit and you're working with a garment so that project we had to design it in two months and then make all the construction documents and have everything ready and then for instance yes the only time i really had the time is when there was an american academy and had the time to really kind of think about <laughs> things more about it and kind of reflect on it and that's why i think that's important but most of my projects even the the, the project that we're working right now um in, in san diego that's the one in some way we had a little more time but now it's like sometimes it's costing you money right it's money costing you because you're paying we're living right now like for, uh, the 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 the, the the building we're, we're paying is costing us money. So everything is costing you money and at the end it, makes a, it's a, it creates a big uh, pressure. So we are always thinking how to create architecture that is kind of the, the, the um, I'm gonna go inside because uh, 
is the battery is running low. Uh, but you're we always are working in projects that there has to be responding to economic factors in the timelines in the context that we are working here in in in, in this in this region. There's, we cannot do that. We got one more question, uh, or at least a hand raised. Jacqueline. Hi, I have a question for Marcel. Yes. Um, you were talking about a composition of ideas, but do you mean composition like a harmony throughout like a site that you're working on or what do you mean by composition? When I mean composition is, is in, in many regards, so all of it, like for instance, the how you treat the, the, the windows and how the composition of windows, right? That's one, the composition of, of the walls, but also composition in the sense of how you create the organization of space. And I mean, even in my studios, I always say, although you, when you see a floor plan, you think you're not you're not going to see it, but almost saying there's a graphic quality of composition and proportions you create in the floor plan. In that floor plan, the way you nest rooms, the way you construct these spaces, are important in talking about composition. So I say composition in many in many levels, from the way that is being placed in the in the context, but also in the organization of interior space, even furniture, all these elements have a, a rhythm. And even sometimes you can, I always talk to the students that even you can, if you put a sound to these elements, you can hear rhythms in how the furniture, how the, the elements have this kind of rhythm to things in composition in that sense. Okay, awesome, thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I think there's also composition in drawings. I mean, you, you, you put, I mean, Marcel's great at this stuff. I mean, we talked about the stuff he showed today earlier, and there were two drawings that he actually, between when I talked to him earlier this week and when I talked to him, or when he presented today, he'd actually combined them. And it was really, a, it was a great moment for him to sort of clarify how he was talking about the outdoor spaces and the relationships that the, um, projects had to each other and how the, there were two images but they were rotated on top of each other and it was a really great composition of the drawing that illustrated an idea that was relevant on the project. Yeah, I, I agree that, uh, I don't know if that's successful, right? Thank you, if you think it's successful, <laughs> that's successful. But I always try to do just composition that, um, that composition can be part of, of drawing, yes. And I always try also with students saying, we can always cut, we can always cut a building, we could always create a floor plan, we could always create these kind of very standard ways of showing representation. But sometimes you need to create a fusion of these drawings or a fusion of these elements, section perspective, section with an axonometric section, where these drawings are becoming compositionally a hybrid, I would say. And then these hybrid, these, these drawings, they become very unique of expressing the strength of the strategy of the project. The suddenly drawing becomes very specific in showing what is the idea of the project. So for me, sometimes I go more like how to be strategic and I'm sorry to say that, how a drawing is going to say to the client, this drawing is very unique and, and I try to kind of combine in some way that exemplifies the concept that I'm trying to, to get to. Anyways, uh, we, we got another question from Sean Nguyen. Um, Catherine and Marcel, both of, you, both of your presentations are very inspirational. With the current pandemic situation, in what aspect will it change our architectural industry? Hmm. Uh, Catherine? <laughs> well, I can, uh, I don't, I think that, um, I think in history, we, it's not the first time we have gone through a pandemic. In history, we have gone through a pandemic, and 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 even in in the beginning, uh, if in in history, we seen that Mar Marcos Aurelio. Sorry, Catherine, I go back to Italy to kind of talk about this. I'm Italian, but uh, Marcos Aurelius, when the, when Marcos Aurelius was an emperor, right? Uh, he was in Rome. He they went through they went through this process of of a pandemic, and and, and for many years, and killed a lot of people. And uh, and we they, they suddenly there was a series of um, ways that, that that they started to design and, and, and propose in the city to create kind of way uh, more separation isolation and and so on. But very interestingly, when the things started to come down, we know that the city changed, and we know that 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 the city clearly transformed, and people wanted to be together also once again. 
And that, that, that's not the only time, but that happens in, in many times. And in the beginning, even planning, and when, when it started kind of uh, being more sanitized, the cities, and all these things. And sometimes even uh, health officials were the planners of the cities, right? And suddenly right now we're, we're can you hear me? Right now we're, we're in almost like how uh, maybe uh, sanitation or health officials are, are going to kind of make a series of rules of how we're going to move through the year or two years that we're going to do and not, not architects are, being, are going to be the ones who are really planning how we move through space. But I think that at the moment uh, we are there is a very uh, a polemic condition of, of space, right? We need to be two feet, three feet, or whatever it becomes spatial, right? And how uh, we as organizers are how to kind of figure out ways of structuring space. Anyways, I think that cities many there's many things they're saying cities are going to be transformed, and, and, and the city as we know now is not going to be the same. I don't know. But I, I think it's. I think. I think we're going to continue have cities. I think we're we're still going to have cities in that sense. I think we're still going to gather. Where it's going to be a process. Maybe in the next year or two years, it's not going to be exactly what we were doing before, and it's going to change the different ways of interacting. But I think this, the cities, the idea of being together and kind of having interaction, that's going to continue. And it might change a bit, but I don't think it's going to change in a way. We have seen at one moment they say the facts are going to change us, that the telephone is going to change us, the computer is going to change us, and yes, it has changed us, but it has not changed the way we interact. It's, it's astonishing how, for instance, um, this, uh, what do you call the, like the we work and these things that everybody thought that that, how strange people are, can be freelance and go to a place to hang out together and kind of create a connection and be together with other people and work. So I think this, my opinion, I think is, is, is going to be uh, a, a year or two years, and it's, but it's gonna, we're gonna still continue kind of finding ways to kind of be together. I think I would, I absolutely agree. I think we're at, it's a real opportunity, right? I mean, it could be sort of, a, you know, how do we get back to the sort of nostalgia of, the world pre-COVID, and or is there a, kind of the potential of a of another world, a world that we're much more interested in participating in the making of? I, I don't think um, humanity is going to change radically that much. I think the industry probably will slow down quite a bit, um, and that the way we work will be much more um, slower paced, so that you're not having these kind of huge confluences of people because the reality of getting a work built um, takes an army and that army is going to have to be, we're going to have to think about how that army is cared for. Anybody else a question? Or something? No, I think, I think we're good. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, you guys. Marcel, Catherine, it was really inspiring. It really was. It, it always, I always get um, frustrated. And this is a moment where it just really made me continue and to keep thinking about design and the relationship to our world, um, given the conditions that we're in right now. So thank you, you guys, so much for doing this. Well, thank um, you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody, you. for listening to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And one last thing before everybody goes is that this is being recorded and then I'm going to upload it on YouTube. So it's going to be a reference for other people. If they didn't get a chance to see it or if um, you want to refer back to it. I know I will personally. So um, just to let you know, we'll probably send out information related to that soon. Cool. Nice to see Hi, alumni guys. in that mix too. Okay. So. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.